will pay you uh, long term over the long haul from your home. So let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Ryan Thompson, one of the founders of Actives, along with David Brown. I'm the president, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little story, if that's okay for everybody on this. My story starts back in January of 1995. I hope you can all remember January of 1995. It's uh, it was kind of, a, for those of you that don't remember that year that are watching this, maybe for the, you know, who maybe were born in that year or, or maybe sometime thereafter, 1995-96 um, was kind of the advent of the internet. I don't remember the exact year that Al Gore invented it, but it would, I'm just joking that would, that, that joke used to be hilarious back in the days of George W. Bush, but it's not really funny anymore. Um, but all that said, the reason why I bring that up is because we didn't have online, uh, companies didn't have websites to go to. And I was working for a company and I can remember people would call me and say, what is our, our, our the website for, the, for, for our company? And I would turn around, I'd look at a whiteboard and I would read it because I didn't have a clue what I was saying. And I would read it and I would read HTTP colon slash slash www and i'd look at the guy next to me i sat in a cubicle and I, and I would say i don't i don't know what i'm saying right now is this is this is greek and then i'd say dot new skin n-u-s-k-i-n dot com and that was the company that i worked for and i remember thinking this is crazy what's happening you know what what is a website first of all but that's what back when the you know uh, the, the the companies that were the the service providers had names like excite and um, well, Yahoo's still around. Um, I can't remember some of the others, but you, you, you remember that time period. That's, that, that, that's what I remember about 1995. Why do I tell this story? Why do I start talking, uh, why does this even matter? In that year, in January of 95, when I started to work at this company, I had a title, which was, uh, well, I was in communications, the communications department. I was the guy that people would call along with my coworkers when they wanted to know what was going on in the company, right? If there was a promotion going on, they wanted to know if, uh, uh, you know, what the new product was about or when we were going to launch uh, the next event or, you know, just kind of ask me questions about the company. They had questions about how to do business in international markets. They had questions about um, compliance, how to talk about products. And so this was a consumer goods company that sold products, skincare and nutritional products. And I started to learn as the months went by a little bit about the nature of this company. But why January of 1995 stands out uh, and, and, and is burned in my memory is not because of any of that really. It's because that was the year that I would every month on about the 14th or the 15th of the month, I would have people calling me and ask me what their paycheck was for that month. And, and we mailed checks. I actually, I was a, an account manager was my official title. And I would have about 200 people that I worked with. I really talked to maybe a hundred of them during the month, but 200 of them were kind of assigned to me. I was a concierge agent for them. And I worked with them. Now, what I learned about these people is most of them got involved in that company during the years of 1984, 1985, 1986, all the way through 1990, right? Now this was 1995, but the point is, is they, they, they'd been involved for some cases, 11 years before I got there, right? They were some of the founding uh, distributors, even though I didn't know what distributor meant really, right? I thought that there were salespeople is what I thought. But here's why I remember January of 1995. I remember them calling me for the first time and saying, hi, Ryan, uh, I wanna know what my check is this month. I'm gonna give you my ID number. So they give me their ID numbers about, a, it was a six digit number and I'd enter it into an old fashioned dot matrix system called, um, what was Sequoia, um, but it was called Data General. I'm sure no one watching this remembers these, but if you remember it's a black screen with the, the green flashing blinking light, that was like the, the early iteration of you know, computers and that's what we use. So I would look up people's checks and what I saw really kind of changed the course of my, my career. I was a college student at the time. I had bounced around, I changed my, my major to lots of different things. I ended up getting a degree uh, in Spanish and psychology. I think maybe at the time I was pre-law, I don't know, but I bounced around. But nonetheless, what I saw on my screen prompted me over the, the, the coming months and years to change my career because I would 
answer the phone and my, my answer sounded a bit like this. Craig, your, your check this month is $230,000. Um, I had another guy named Craig Bryson and Craig Tillotson. Craig, your check is, is $400,000 this month. A guy who I'm still friends with, Rich Ferlanic. Rich, your check this month is $90,000. And I went on and on and on. And I would just get tons of phone calls on the 15th because people would want, want, want to know their check was. There was not really any such thing as direct deposit, right? We mailed their checks to them. And month after month after month, I worked with these individuals. And what I learned about them was they weren't employees. They also weren't salespeople. They were independent contractors. It was as though, now this is not a legal term, but it, it was as though they had their own independent distribution franchise for that company, New Skin. They had gotten involved early on in that company, right? They started, they shared the benefits of the products with people they knew, other people who are entrepreneurial like them or somewhat entrepreneurial. And as they did that, we, the company began, we would pay them a residual override on the purchase and consumption of product each and every month. And some of them who got involved in that first, really it was the first six years of that company, because in 1990, that company really started to grow. They, they came out with many more products. They started to expand into all these international markets. And the people who were involved early on, they benefited by, by, by the mere fact that they were there early. Um, I, we're going to go some, mute some people here. Okay. Um, and I uh, hope you can hear me okay. And... Uh, and that, that was my foray into an industry, which I, I later learned, um, and today is about a $200 billion industry called direct selling, the Direct Selling Association. In fact, it, it, uh, uh, there's a, a, an association that's sort of the oversight organization for direct selling companies like that. It's a legitimate form of business. They've cut out the middlemen. There's no one in the middle, um, no jobbers getting, getting product into stores. It is simply an independent contractor or distributor who has a direct relationship with the wholesaler of the company. And so I, I discovered that there was a far better way to earn income. And I, and I, and I frankly, these people who, with whom I worked and with, who, with whose accounts I managed, they had spent maybe three to five years really investing heavily into building their own businesses. And what they earned was about what, was what you would expect somebody to earn after a 20 to 30 or three to five years, sometimes six years, sometimes 10 years. Nonetheless, they dramatically decreased the amount of time that it took them to earn this income. Here's what I also learned, right, from this early experience. And I ended up staying at this company for eight years. And I, and I grew in the company and I worked in all different departments there. And I really learned the business from different perspectives. I worked in, the, in, in compliance, in the legal department. I worked in marketing. I worked in, um, I opened an, up an office in San Francisco, California. I was headquartered uh, in, in, in Utah. I worked uh, with Asia Pacific, um, who would actually come, uh, ma many members from Asia Pacific, they'd come from Japan to San Francisco, come to my office and then go on to Utah. So I kind of learned and got a perspective from working with all these different types of people who were all independent distributors of this company who had created fortunes fortunes and today the year 2020 we're in october 2020 those same people are still earning that and and it's been passed down from generation to generation so we're now on to that's a 34 36 year old company and 36 i believe 36 year old company and so you know many of these businesses have, have been passed down to their children and maybe in some cases their children's children right this long-term residual income so like i said this was my introduction i remember talking to my parents on the weekend and uh, telling my dad what these people were making. And he kind of laughed. I'm not sure if he really took me seriously, but he said something that I will never forget. He said, well, Ryan, you should probably change your major, right? And he could not have been more spot on. Um, I didn't end up changing, well, I did change my major, but I ended up graduating. And rather than um, going with any of the offers that I was receiving or going back to graduate school, um, I, took a, I took an LSAT, I took a GRE, just preparing to do something. I, I spent a lot of money on classes to go back, but guess what I did? I ended up staying in this industry because I fell in love with entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship, and with helping people, be, with helping people to be empowered, 
teaching them how to pull themselves up from their bootstraps, take control of their own financial destiny, teach them and educate them around a concept called financial leverage or leveraging. Um, and and to, to just to, to shed some light on that, there is an, a, an age old uh, famous statement from Andrew Carnegie that said, I'd rather have 1% of 100 people's efforts rather than 100% of my own efforts. That's a great example of what it is to, be, to, for, to leverage yourself financially, right? Um, building a system, right? Constructing a system or plugging into a system that's turnkey that, that maximizes, call it 1% of many, many people's efforts. And um, in fact, Robert Kiyosaki has gone on to opine about this concept and Rich Dad, Poor Dad and some of his other lectures and books about the importance of building networks and how wealthy people, they don't, they, what they build, they don't work for other people, they build networks, okay? So these are all concepts that I picked up in my early years in the mid, early, mid 1990s. And uh, it left an indelible uh, imprint on my memory and it really informed the direction of my career and what I chose to do. Because in the year 2001, I, I got off the bench and decided to get in the game myself as a distributor. And I had some fun. I, 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 I you know, unfortunately, I bounced around for, to, 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 uh, to a few different companies. And then I found a home, which I really sunk my teeth into. And I learned to build my own passive residual income through a technology company that at the time was called ACN. And, and, and this, just to tell you how long ago that was, this was before you know, cell phones and smartphones were really the thing. And there was no such thing as bundled services. So everybody bought long distance and people were starting to buy dial up and DSL. And so my business was entirely built, my personal business on long distance. Fast forward a few years and I realize I'm telling a story but you're gonna remember this story. Fast forward a few years down the road, um, it was 2003, I lost my entire business to something that I, 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 and it's another concept, it's called a disruptive technology. For those of you hearing this for the first time, what is a disruptive technology? Well, think about MP3s, think about CDs, think about cassette tapes, think about what was before cassette tapes, the big giant one, I can't remember what they call that. Um, uh, those, those represent cycles of, of disruptive technologies, right? One new technology, is developed and it disrupts an entire industry and it puts other products and services out of business. That is what is disruptive about it, okay? So I learned, I, I personally was the victim of a disruptive technology. I lost my entire network marketing business, all my thousands of customers, I had hundreds of, dis, of distributors to companies like at and and Comcast and Pacific Bell and um, uh, all those companies, high tech companies, that stopped selling long distance, right? And, and, and uh, I helped some of my people get out of their contracts. I went back to the corporate side and then in 2006, I rejoined the distributor force and, and uh, not the distributor force, but I, I decided to start, start, be, to start my own companies. Started a company that was later sold called Core Vital. I got to participate in founding a company called Zri. And at that company, I met some of the great people that are joining us on this call right now. Trish Albertson, who introduced me. I met she and her whole family. We became fast friends and, and worked with her. And she actually became one of the top earners in that company. That was 2007. And from then on, we've kind of moved our way through the industry and replicated that success. And here we are in 2020, and we have decided to start a new company. This is, for me, this is the last hurrah. I know for Tricia, it's her last hurrah. And other uh, leaders in, this, in, the, in our company, Actives, this is our last hurrah. Because once you figure out this model, you know that you can duplicate it. You know that it can re be replicated. So let me stop telling my story. I tell you that story because, uh, well, Frankly, facts tell, but stories sell, and you're going to remember that story. But that's how I was introduced to this industry. Before I shift gears completely, let me ask you all a question who are watching this. How many people do you think over the years have told me that this doesn't work? How many people, just guess, how many people do you think have tried to convince me that direct selling, network marketing, multi-level marketing, whatever you want to call it, social selling, social networking, I mean, there's all these other terms for it. Um, don't work. Gil, you're raising your hand three. I've had ton, probably hundreds of people over the last 25 years try to convince me that this is a scam, that it doesn't work. And I listen to them and with uh, a lot of, you know, I, uh, empathy and respect, 
I wait till they're done. And then I explain to them that they're trying to convince the wrong person because I wasn't introduced to this industry because I was invited to watch a Zoom or go to an opportunity meeting or an in-home meeting or, or, or watch a short video. I got a job as a college student as a essentially a, um, an elevated customer service agent. I made maybe 10 to $12 an hour. And for months and then years of spending time at that company, I, I learned, a, I, I gained a great conviction of the viability of this business as in fact, probably one of the purest forms of, of free market capitalism, right? Where someone who's entrepreneurial can enter and join, make, start their own business at a very low barrier of entry and based on their own industriousness and vision and hard work, they can earn more money and not just exchanging time for dollars, but in a, in a passive residual manner, building an asset that will pay them long, you know, tomorrow based on what they did yesterday. I learned that firsthand and I, and I have hundreds and hundreds of examples. And over the years, many people, and I, I could probably say hundreds of people that I've helped retire, that I've helped replace their income and spend their life the way they want to spend it. And I don't like to sound cheesy or come across, across as cliche in any way, but this is very real, right? So in other words, a lot of people have tried to convince me this doesn't work. And they, you know, th th this is um, something that um, I've stayed in this industry because it's a real industry and because of its viability, okay? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about barrier of entries, you, you can go start your own business, right? It's going to require capital. You can go buy a franchise. It's going to be an average of a million dollars, depending on the city, the state, or the country. And it's going to take you how many years to recoup that, that investment? Whereas here in Act is, you can invest uh, for the price of the product, right? And you're going to get a, a replicated website. You're going to get an online virtual office. You're going to get tools. You're going to get an application, an, app, an application, a phone app. Um, with tools and training materials where you can simply plug in, start sharing these tools through social media or when your circle is network or, or uh, beyond your, 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 your circle, um, your warm market, your circle, your network. And you can start finding people who like you are willing to spend a minimum of, a, of an hour a day following a system to begin to replace their full-time income. So in other words, that's what we offer. That, that, these are the broad strokes of what our opportunity looks like. And how much is it? Well, a premium pack, something that's going to give you 13 of our, of our products that are, that are highly consumable, they're scientifically backed, um, that you can share with people. Why does that matter? Because the key is to put products in people's hands who are going to use them and get results. When those people get results, guess what they do with those results? They don't go and bury them in their backyard. They open their mouth and they tell somebody what happened. They tell someone how they feel. They tell someone how their life has gotten better. And this word of mouth marketing, person to person marketing, uh, is the most powerful, most effective way today to build any brand or any business of your own. So whether it's McDonald's or Quiznos or Subway or any franchise or Chevy's restaurant, right? Or act is, you've got to ask yourself, what's the barrier of entry? How long will it take me to recoup that investment? And what can I make long-term? Let me share, let me shift gears and talk a little bit about that. What you make long-term. And, and, and I realize I haven't said anything about our products yet. I think for people hearing this for the first time, I'm going to spend 45 seconds quickly on the products. Um, for this to work in any industry and to have any kind of staying power, the products have to have a few things. First, they have to be highly consumable. Meaning if you're marketing something that's niche, right? I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm not French, so I'm not going to pronounce it that way. I'm going to say niche, niche market, right? Um, you're going to have a hard time being around in the future. Okay. I've been in companies like that, that had something really novel, but only appealed to people who were vegans or, or vegetarians or alkalarians. And that was the, you know, represent a very, very small slice of the population. So you want something that's not a me too or a knockoff, but that's highly consumable. Right, that has that that has demand across the board, right, and that that is uniquely that, that's uniquely situated in the market. So it's not a knockoff. Our products are epigenetic products. What is epigenetics? Epigenetics is really the future of wellness, and I will uh, I'll dare say medicine. 
Epigenetics means that they have been studied, researched, and formulated to work at the genetic level to optimi optimize our genetic expression. We know that we all have between 19 to 20,000 genes and families of genes. And what doctors and scientists are able to do now is they're able to identify such things that are referred to as survival genes. They're able to upregulate that production. They're also able to identify certain genes and family of families of genes that have um, that are tied to negative predispositions, whether it's addictions or other ailments, and they can downregulate those. So each of our products is an epigenetic product. We market three products that are called the trifecta. Um, and uh, you can check out our website or talk to the person who invited you to find out more about that. And then we have a cutting edge uh, skincare line, which is really a powerful anti-aging um, skin treatment. And it's called Amore. You can check out, uh, out, out at those. So I'm not going to go more about the products. The reason why I shared what I did is because when you're going to start your own business, you must ask yourself, is what I have something that people are going to want? Is it easy to talk about it? Is it, is, is, it, is, it, is it too narrow or is it broad? Does it appeal to the broad audience and epigenetic products that do what our products do? They in, in, enhance and, and bolster you, your immune system. They reduce oxidative stress, which is a foothold for hundreds of, of, of diseases and illnesses. I mean, these are really things that are the latest and greatest in scientific research. So check them out on our website. Talk to the person who invited you to watch this video. Let's get back to the business. How do you make money? I would invite you to pull out a pen and a piece of paper and create two columns. In the left-hand column, I want you to write down the number 42%. Under that, write 8%. Under that, write 1%. And under that, write 1%. I want you to put an equal sign next to that column, and that's going to say 52%. Now, that's the left-hand column. On the right hand column, I want you to write 41%, 8%, 1%, and 1%. That total is 51%. Now, underneath these two columns, I want you to write $100, $250, $500, $1,000, $2,500. Okay? So, what you should have on a piece of paper, an envelope, or a napkin, or your sock, or your back of your hand, whatever you happen to be writing on, is our numbers totaling 52% in one column, 51% in the other column. And then there's some actual cash amounts there at the bottom. What we do as a company is for every product that's sold, every product that's sold, we take it and we divide it up in the way that I just explained to you. In the left-hand column, we do that for people who are played for, for first time orders. Every first time order gets sliced and diced with those percentages. Every reoccurring order or subsequent order gets sliced and diced according to the second column. Okay, I've just taught you something that's called a, a, um, a, uh, a, a compensation plan, right? Or a revenue share plan. If you wanna know how people make money here, it's, it, it's, it's what I just described. We take every product and we divide it up in, in those different segments. Now we pay a piece of those percent of those percentiles to each of our distributors who shares the benefits of these products or the company with others. So in other words, if you're like me in 1978, right? I don't know, maybe I, I'm gonna assume that you are all as old as me. I'm sure that some of you aren't. 1978, I stayed the night at a friend's house and his mom took us to a video. I'm sorry, to a movie, not, not a video, a movie. And that movie, friends, changed my life. It changed my life. It was ridiculous, but it changed my life. How many of you can guess what that movie was? It was Star Wars, right? Some people say Jaws. No, it was Star Wars. She would have been a bad mother had she taken us to see Jaws. It was Star Wars. I was a fanatic. I think I was, well, I don't think. I know I was seven years old in 1978. Guess what I did when I went to school the next day? Do you think I kept it to myself? that I saw seeing that movie? No, I was a chatterbox and I talked to everybody. In fact, what I started to do is I started to cut out little uh, Star Wars clips from newspapers and I put them in a folder and my mom still has a folder of all of these advertisements that I would cut out from newspapers that show the Star Wars logo. I did that for years. Now, for those people who wanna tell me that 
that word of market, word of mouth marketing doesn't work and that you really can't make money and that the percentages I just shared with you would never get paid to you. They're lying to you because let me tell you, do you, do you think I made Columbia Pictures any money or George uh, uh, or uh, Steven Spielberg or George, help me out here, George Lucas any money? I think I made them a ton of money. And I think that all of you who saw that movie and told a friend, oh, wow, I just saw a movie last night. It's called Star Wars. It's pretty amazing. They've got this big furry rug that walks around named Chewie. We all made them lots of money. We've never, this has not been quantified though. They like to think it's their advertising. Forrester Research, one of the biggest market research companies in the United States, published a very interesting statistic. They said the number one reason why people do what they do and buy what they buy is because it was recommended to them by someone they know and trust. It's the number one driver of consumer decisions. You know what number two is? Number three, number four, uh, TV ads, um, uh, celebrity endorsements, um, social media campaigns. Like there's this totem pole of importance. The number one a uh, uh, way to drive consumer awareness and, and buying decisions is word of mouth marketing. Why? We trust the opinions of people we know. So when my brother-in-law tells me, Ryan, I'm using a product and I can focus really well. And it's given me some great energy. And furthermore, it's scientifically validated. There's all these studies on pubmed.gov. When he tells me that, what do you think I tell him? I say, wow. Kevin, I'd love to try that. that. That sounds great. But if I saw it on TV, I'd probably, eh, I don't know if I can really trust that. Or if it's a pop-up online, I don't know. There's thousands of these. So again, I'm underscoring the importance of word of mouth marketing. 1978, you want to know what the travesty of my story is? Going back to 78, how many checks do you think I got in the mail from Columbia Pictures or from Steven Spielberg or from George Lucas or from Luke Skywalker for that matter? How many checks? Guys, the travesty of my story is that I've gotten none. I'm still waiting for that check, just like all of you should be waiting. Anyone who criticizes direct selling or network marketing is fooling themselves. Why? Because unlike Columbia Pictures, unlike the movie industry, unlike the book industry, unlike restaurants, unlike anything that is really driven through word of mouth, mouth marketing, we pay our independent contractors, our independent distribution franchise um, owners for talking about it, for being trained storytellers, for just sharing the benefits of the products, okay? So those percentages that I shared with you is what we pay people when they make that recommendation, like my brother-in-law, Kevin, right? Ryan, I'm using a product and it really helps with my focus, right? He's a university professor at the Florida Institute of Technology, okay? So that's an example of word of mouth marketing. And that's why this industry is, ap is, is more than legitimate. It's far more legitimate than companies that pay actors to promote products or actors to promote a service. They're being paid a salary to lie. You know what we don't do? We don't do that. Do you know what we do? When someone uses our products or earns money with our business and then tells someone, this really happened to me, we pay them, right? So you can make quite a bit of money. What differentiates our pay plan from any other direct selling pay plan or rev share plan um, in the world is we have something that, well, two things. First of all, we're gonna pay you 20% every single time any customer of yours orders and purchases product. In the first month, in the 10th month, in the 10th year that they buy product, any customer of yours uh, who buys at a wholesale price, just like you that orders product, you can earn 20%. So we have a lot of doctors, chiropractors, um, uh, massage therapists. We have a lot of people who, who are in the service arena um, that you know they, they don't know how to build a, 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 a residual business per se, but they have a lot of customers, a lot of patients who buy this. And these people are making hundreds and thousands of dollars right now, every month, just from sharing this with product, with customers. So that's one thing that really differentiates us, right? You can, do, you can earn money that way. The other way, is as you grow your business and as you, as you talk to someone who talks to someone who talks to someone and you start earning that passive residual override on products that are taking place and on orders that, from people that you've never met, nor will you ever meet them, right? Um, we give you the opportunity to not just have one position 
not just one independent distribution franchise. You can have a second, you can have a third, and you can have a fourth, and we will allow you to earn four times on the same product purchases, three times, two times, and one and one time. So it will basically take your your check from a fifty thousand dollars a month to one hundred to one hundred fifty and to two hundred thousand dollars a month, and that's just if you're only earning fifty thousand dollars say as an example as an a16 which is our highest rank so i realize i'm getting into some details here talk to the person who invited you to this call for more information about this um if you've never bet on yourself before i challenge you to bet on yourself you really have nothing to lose and you've got everything to gain um, i mentioned at the beginning my story that i ended up graduating in psychology there's a principle in human behavior that i want to share with you uh, to close right now it's called the law of diminishing intent i want you to not be a victim to the law of diminishing intent. What is it you might be asking yourself? The law of diminishing in, it, it, intent is a real phenomenon, right? It's a real phenomenon. And what it says is that when faced with an opportunity to make a decision, most people say, I'm going to think about it. When we make that, when we say that we're going to think about it, do you know what we, we, we do? It's a defense mechanism, it's a coping mechanism. We talk ourselves out of it. We talk ourselves out of most things in life. And we go through our whole life thinking someday my ship is gonna come in. Someday I'm gonna be able to retire my spouse or my parents, or I'm gonna pay for my kids college someday. But we don't ever really take action on that, right? Why? Because so many people fall victim to the law of diminishing intent, right? We essentially turn our backs on the moment and the opportunity to take to make that decision. We talk ourselves out of it. So my only challenge to you is that you make a decision, right? You really don't have anything to lose. At the very minimum, you're going to be able to use our products and have and, and see some great results. At the very best, you're going to make some money, right? And, and you might replace your full-time income with what you generate part-time, working a minimum of one to two to three hours a day. So that's my challenge, my invitation to you. Kick our tires, check us out, talk to the person who invited you tonight. And uh, I'll remind you the quote of, uh, of um, Andrew Carnegie, give me 1% of 100 people's efforts rather than 100% uh, of my own efforts. Folks, this is your opportunity to bet on yourself and we'll see you very soon. And I invite you to check out our next Zoom. We have Zooms taking place throughout the week and hope to, to talk to you someday. Trish, I'll turn the time back to you.